All right, so there are three things I wanted to talk about today. We might not finish all of them. Uh, one is summarize again just the vectorized backward propagation. Okay. Second, I want to go through various classifications, binary, multi-class, multi-label, and then we're going to get started with the convolutional neural network. Okay. So the vectorized backward propagation. In computing the error, at the last layer, and I, so this is the same formulas that we used before, but rather than using sigma notation, I'm just leaving an impartial derivative notation because a sigma notation may actually make it just add one more level of complexity to this. So this tells us that the J represents, you know, the cost function. In the example we had done, we didn't have a cost function. Or I guess another way we could have looked at the cost function, we said the cost function is equal to, to y hat, right? So we were actually just differentiating f, the result coming out of our sigmoid. But in any case, so this is the cost function, and And z at l is weighted sum, last layer, right. And so we need to take the derivative of j with respect to a at l, right, which is the output of the activation. How are we going to know how to do this? How will we calculate this? Say again? Cost yeah, you use cost function and you're going to have to take the derivative, right? So you'll take j prime, basically. And then g of l prime applied to the weighted sum of the last letter. And then what we're saying is that the weight, the, um, to get the derivative of a farther, an earlier layer, use the derivative of the next layer. And we got the derivative of the next layer. And then how? So we've got these errors. How should we apportion these errors back to the previous? Well, we should use the weights, right? The weight told us how to go from layer L to L plus 1. And so we use those same weights going back to apportion the error. So that's this term. And then we'll multiply it by, again, the derivative of L minus 1 times. And then the bias is just equal to the error of the weighted input. And the error for a particular weight is equal our activation for the previous layer times the derivative, and where I was missing a transpose here in previous slides. These slides all are available, or will be available as soon as class is over online. And I may even try to put them up before class so you could print them if you wanted, but that requires actually finishing them. Well, they are all finished before class, I guarantee you that. And the subscript i here is not necessary. So when we talk about the derivative of j with respect to w at l, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to vectorize this. And so therefore, I am saying the derivative of j with respect to all of the weights, the entire weight vector. So let's take a look at Python notebook again. So this is Python notebook 7.
All right, so All right, so we had looked at this before, right? We've looked at this more than once. Um, now I'm just going to be using, rather than the individual operations, I'm going to be using the higher level sigmoid. Okay? So I'm defined, so it's a one layer neural network with a sigmoid activation function, and we don't have, really have a cost function. And I'm using NumPy to do this to give you an example of how to do it. Okay. Uh, one layer means there's no, not necessarily one hidden layer. There's just one layer. So here it is. We've got our input layer. So we say W1x1 plus W2x2 plus B. We apply an activation function. We're done. So we can divide sigmoid in P is 1 over 1 plus. So we're taking the exponent using num NumPy to do that. Why are we using NumPy to do this? Instead of just using math, dot x faster. No, that it's any faster because if I'm calling math dot x, what am I passing as a parameter? One number. So if I've got one number, math dot x is just as fast as numpy dot x. The advantage is we can have multiple. Um, Elements, right? We can pass in an entire array. All right, so that's that. And because we're going to want it, we're going to want to know the derivative. So the derivative is the sigmoid times 1 minus the sigmoid. Uh, there's no ReLU here, is there? But I thought it might be useful for you for your assignment too. So the ReLU, we want to. Um, find the maximum of zero and, and each element. So we do this again using NumPy. This, I, as we look, let's see, in PyTorch, we didn't have maximum. Instead, if you remember, we looked, there's a clamp, and you can specify a minimum. Same idea there. Okay. To do the derivative, basically anything less than or equal to zero, we want to be zero, right? Anything greater than or equal to zero, we want to be 1. So the way to do that is we can do a NumPy where, and we provide a predicate. And so if z is greater, less than or equal to 0, we want 0, otherwise we want 1. And then I see it. That's a, all at once works on, uh, on our own. For our use, we don't really care about the speed. What we care about is the ease of being able to work with arrays rather than work with individual values. And then our weighted sum just as a matrix multiplied wa. Okay, the numerical differentiation, we've looked at this before, but I've made it easier, okay? Because what I had before was I was littering a bunch of global variables. A1 and W1, sorry, W1, W2, X1, X2, B, uh, the output for all these values. And so here instead what I've got is a set of parameters. So these are all the weights and biases and x, and if I had a loss function, I'd throw y in here too. So it's everything that you would need to calculate the loss. All right, so we have an array of three and negative two, w1, an array with one and zero, and then our b. And so f is gonna take our parameters, and it is gonna, let's just ignore v for a second here. We're gonna calculate the value of layer one, the weighted sum, and we'll calculate the weighted sum of x, w1, and b1. And then we'll apply the sigmoid operation to the z to get the a. We're saving these in what I call think of as values, in a values dictionary, because later on when we're calculating, doing the back propagation, we need to know those values. So that's why we got them. So f is going to return not only the result, but also the entire set of values. And so then when we call f, we'll save our result and our solar values. And then in order to change the values, it'll be very simple, because we can just clone the dictionary, update 
the first element of W1. This is not right. So I will fix it and I will check in a fix. What is W1 at 0? What type of a thing? It's what? W1 is a? It's a NumPy array. How many dimensions? Two, because we get two sets here, right? So therefore, at zero is a, a one-dimensional array, and so we went at zero at zero. So this was actually adding epsilon to every element, which is not what we want. So just look at the value f is 0 0.7. DFDW is 1966. After I make that cha change, it's entirely different. And no longer matches. Oh, wait, you lost. FDW on 5898, 5898. That's correct. And down here, it's 5898. Okay, so anyway, now it's correct. This is good. All right, so any questions on that? Uh, simple use of dictionaries to feed in parameters and dictionaries to feed out the intermediate results. Okay. So now when we can do the back propagation, we can go ahead and do this. I don't know if you remember, but that backpropagation for this was, was fairly complex. So now what we'll do is we'll say, well, d loss, we're going to just say the loss is equal to layer 1a. That's a stupid loss function, but that's what it is. So the derivative of that is just equal 1. So we'll set, we'll create an array 1. And then we'll draw a matrix multiply of that loss times our sigmoid prime of the Weighted sum at this point. And this is where we're using the values. And then d loss d1 equals the map mole of x, right, which is basically the input from the previous layer, times the loss 1z transpose. Because we're, uh, before we were taking the output of one layer and multiplying it by the uh, weight. And here, we're sort of going back. Params of x, well, params of x, would that like generalize to e? This would generalize, exactly, to, well, so that's a good question. If you have a multi-layer thing, what would this be? It'd be, uh, L minus 1, and it, what value of L minus 1? Eight. Yeah, so would that be in params? Where would you find it? So good. Where would you find the value of A for a particular layer? Where do we find the value Z of a particular layer? Yeah, in that values. The intermediate values. So we would also use the intermediate values here. That's exactly it. So we get the same loss. And I haven't changed the PyTorch uh, version of this. But having actually solved assignment two myself, I found it made it much easier if you were starting with something like this than having Again, littered with, littered with global variables, sort of like I had done here. And it got even worse because these x1, w1s, x2, w2s, and z's, I was using the same names here as I was up above the numerical differentiation. And so I could accidentally be using one or the other when the last one was. And also, I had the same names for functions, too, which made life very difficult. So questions on that? So I mean, for problem one, for example, uh, if we're using, uh, for, it asks us to control all our work. If we're yes. using, uh, say, like a, a Jupyter notebook to, to do these calculations, it's sufficient to just show you the code we use for the calculations. We have to actually like, manually show the calculations. No, if you show the, if you show the, the, the Python, yeah. If you write a program to do it, 
and then show the program and answer that. But we are trying to do, again, both the numerical and uh, numerical differentiation plus the back propagation as a double check. All right, now various kinds of classification. We've talked about this at length. I've got some better names for it. Binary classification, multi-class classification, which says we have multiple classes, but we still only choose one of them, like dog breed. Or multi-label, where you, can have, you have a set of classes or a set of labels, and you can choose zero or more of those labels. Okay. So if we wanted to know objects in this room, what kind of a classification task would that be? Multi-label. If we wanted to know uh, well, the dog breeds and the dog cats. <laughs> I'll a good example. So binary classification. First off, you don't have to set, you don't have a special case binary classification. Binary classification is just multi-class classification with how many classes? Two. If you want to do one class classification, how do you do it? Well, except, well, I guess that's kind of a stupid question. Let me put it this way instead. Binary classification is the same multi-class classification with two classes. What is multi-class classification with one class? And how hard it is to determine what class something is in. There's only one class. It's like you output one, right? And you're right. Because, yes, everything is something. Anyway. Um, so for the binary classification, we'll do the sigmoid activation function. The loss function that you're going to use is binary cross entropy. So minus y log y hat plus 1 minus y log 1 minus y hat. Keep in mind, y has what value? Now, y is not, well, y is between 0 and 1, but we can be a lot more specific. Remember, y is our target. It's, it's, it's the ground truth, right? So is it a dog or a cat? My value is 0 or 1. So therefore, this devolves to either this term, if y is 1, or this term, if y is 0. And we can see that right there. If you're vectorizing this, you've got to do some more work, right? If y is uh, a, a vector of values because you're using multiple instances, then you're going to have to kind of do the right thing to do either negative log of y hat for, for the one elements or negative log of 1 minus y hat. So negative log of 1 minus y hat, what sort of a value are we getting out here? Right, and, and does this sense. I don't know. If we had a spreadsheet, let me just go look. We do have a spreadsheet. All right. So let's just look at some uh, numbers here. Let me make this bigger. All right. So we want to see if something is a dog. If our z output is 8, our sigmoid is 0.999665, and our loss function which again is just the log as I've described it, it's like that. So so we have positive numbers because the log of a number between 0 and 1 is negative. And we want positive values, so this is the negative log because it's a minimization problem we're doing. If we're doing a maximization problem, we'd, we'd leave this there. Uh, what if they've got negative numbers here? Then we get closer to zero, right? So this is what we expect the sigmoid to do. It takes it between zero and one. And if we get, you know, too far, we're pretty darn close to zero. 
Any, so does that make sense? So we have very, very low loss if we are very, very close to our target. And we're symmetric in terms of 0 and 1, right? If the target were 1 and this were that same delta from, sorry, if our target were 0 and this was the same delta from 0, we get the same loss. Questions on this? All right, we've got our multi-class classification. K neurons represents our K classes. This is the soft mass activation function. I lied earlier. I said it was actually the sigmoid over the sum of the sigmoids, and it's just simpler. Right? It's just e to the, to the value over the sum of those values. So we're guaranteed to be between 0 and 1, and we're guaranteed that they sum to 1. The loss function you use for multi-class classification normally, there are other ones, but this is commonly what's used as a cross entropy. So it is for each of the y's, it's yi times log of y hat i. So for how many of these yi's is yi one? Just exactly one. And what's the name for that? If we've got, let's say we've got uh, dog breeds, and we've got zero, 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 one, zero. What's the name of that kind of encoding? Have I mentioned that? Yeah, that's one hot. So we could look at this either as the value four or three, depending on whether zero or one based, or we can look at it as a one hot encoding. All zeros for the one. So, we can take the dot product of y and np dot log of y hat. Assuming here y is one hot encoded. If y isn't one hot encoded, right, if you're getting actually like a value of three here, then it would really be the index into this array. Right, you could take the log of y hat at 3. Yeah. So let's go look at this in the spreadsheet. So we've got binary classification. Sorry, multi-class classification. And I've got a small subset of the dog breeds, which you guys went through and memorized all those, right? So this, yeah, the Afrishan Hound or something, is that one of the first ones? I don't remember. So um, these, I had no idea and, and, until um, I met someone a few years ago who owned Vishlas, and now I know what a Vishla is, and now I own Vishlas. So they're pretty cute dogs. So our final layer coming out. Here. So this is going to be close to zero, close to one. Uh, not basically. Which one of these is going to be close to one? This one, right? And that's what. What if? Why do we? It's our target. What are we doing here? Okay. This is better because there should be only one because it's a <laughs> one hot encoding. Not a too hot encoding. Yeah. Did we ever figure in our loss function about how close the other ones are to one? We don't. We don't normally care. So we care about whether we're getting the right class, and we don't care that the other ones are, let's say, evenly distributed as opposed to one is more than the other. Is yeah. this meant to be soft max? For the Because otherwise, the function doesn't really make sense. All right, let me, let me try and figure this out. What happened to my... All right, well, let's fix this while we're here. So this is going to be... So I edited the wrong one, and I, I don't want to do that. 
All right, so we want e to the x, e to the z. All right, final layer. Y hat is supposed to be soft max, and so that's going to be equals this oops, C3 divided by C dollar sign 7. Oh, much better, thank you. All right, this is what it used to look like. I mean, really, I remember. So. <laughs> Okay, so our loss should be relatively low because we're pretty good in here. And it gets pointed out, we don't, we don't care that these were really, really low and all the air was here. We just, are we getting the right class or not? If we reduce, let's say, 11 to 9, all of a sudden our percentage goes way down, right? because we've got an eight sitting there fairly close. So our loss goes up to 0.3. And if we actually got the wrong value, then we're not explicitly finding that we have the, the wrong value. We're just implicitly noticing that we have a very bad probability. Okay. Question? Yeah, I was gonna ask, is there a reason to use very, it's very good at like picking up our things when like two or more of them are really close together, but when you're like one that's like a little higher, it kind of starts ignoring things. Well, the whole point of it, 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 the point of this is that if we've got one that's higher than another, it tends to expand that right. gap, right? Sure. So that so that we become more sure, let's say, of the one that's a little higher. That's the thought. Yeah. Well, the, the main reason we're looking at just that loss is if we don't get the right class, right, if eventually later on we predict something else, we don't really care what we predicted. We were wrong. And so it's are we wrong or are we right and by how much? And really that's just how far are we away from our target for the correct class. All right, and then finally, multi-label classification. We've got k neurons. We've got a sigmoid activation function. And our loss function is the binary cross entropy. The only real difference is we're summing it across all of our classes. Right, so here, we definitely are not ignoring any of them. Right, because the ones that are zero, we want to be close to zero. And the ones that are supposed to be one, we want to be close to one. So we're going to measure how far away we, we are at that. So our multi-label, and as I said, this spreadsheet is, um, the link to it is on a couple slides before this, and you guys have access to it. So is cold, is, I had to figure out what would be good multi-class. So weather, I finally came up with, is cold and is wet. I came up with those fairly quickly, and then it's like, what else is there that's weather related? Raining, no, you gotta get that, that's wet. Snow, well that's kinda like cold and wet. We live in LA, I got smoggy, and then suddenly windy just came to me. So let's say it's cold and windy, actually. Final layer in C, what should we put the label for this as? Should we call it sigmoid? It is sigmoid, yes. So um, let's just make sure that's a sigmoid. Yep, that's a sigmoid. So we have a loss for each one of the classes, and we sum it for our total loss. So we see our highest loss is because it is wet, we're 50-50 on. Okay, so that's the uh, not doing so good. Okay. Anything else is reasonable. So this is pretty close to one, pretty close to one, fairly close to zero. We could get worse. 
right? How would we make is wet give us an even bigger loss? Yeah, bump it up. 20. How, what, what if I put in 19? 19. What just happened? Do, do we agree that's, is that weird? Oh, it's the log of 1 over 1 plus e to the, so I guess, I just, yeah, okay, fine. Does that make sense? So we can play around with this at our heart, to our heart's content. All right, a couple things. So if you're using a loss function that computes log of y, and really this should be y hat, okay, because if we're doing log of y, that's more of a constant. We don't, I mean, if we're computing log of y hat, often it'd be better to not compute the log in the loss function, but to compute the log in the activation function. Right? You have a, a, a choice if you have a log of y hat in your loss function of just moving that log back to the activation function. I'm going to make a slightly different activation function, which is the log activation function, and we'll get rid of the log here. And so log softmax, for instance, exists in PyTorch. And we saw that when we were looking at our um, predictions, what did we get back from PyTorch? Remember, we got log probabilities. And you had to take uh, the exponent, e to that at, to get the, to get the actual probabilities. So. Um, my slides are in an odd order here. So the, for softmax, we can take, we can derive, define log softmax as log of our softmax, pull apart the logs, pull out an x sub i here, and then our categorical cross entropy or our binary cross entropy gets con, um, modified so that we remove our log. Categorical binary cross entropy are two names of the same thing. And what that can do is prevent overflow and underflow by basically taking a, a, a number, taking its log, and then going back, sorry, taking a number and taking it e to the that and then taking the log again. Right? So we avoid this round trip which can cause overflow or underflow. This is mostly hidden from you. You don't have to worry about it, but it's worth knowing. Uh, numerical stability. So for sigmoid, there is an alternate equation for sigmoid. So instead of 1 over 1 plus e to the x, it's e to the x over e to the x plus 1. It's the same thing. But given we have these two formula, it's actually preferable to use 1 if x is negative and another if x is positive. Okay. Because let's say x is negative. What will this first formula give us? So let's say for, uh, if we have x, much less than 0. Then 1 over 1 plus e to the negative x, right, equals 1 over 1 plus e to a large number. Sorry? Yes, but if x is much less than 0. Oh, actually, this one's not so bad. Yeah, which is, which, which goes to zero, and that's not so bad. Wait, which, which is the one I'm concerned about? I'm concerned about 
Ah, here's what I'm concerned about. So, just think about the second. So, if I go to Which one is going to lead us to overflow? So if we have I'm just trying to think if I'm doing these the right order or not. And I will I will I will think about this and come back to it. And get back to you on Monday. Okay. Any questions so far? Questions on the classification or the loss function you use or the activation functions that you're using for those standard classifications? Uh, and one of the questions on your, on your assignment two is what activation functions to use for some particular problems. And really the key to keep in mind is we could use for our final activation function, just a linear activation function if we want for everything. It would just be harder to train your network, for instance, if you're trying to compute probabilities, because it could be coming up with numbers like 10,052, and you say, I really want a number between 0 and 1, you're, you're really far off. Okay. And so by constraining the activation function in terms of its range, you are automatically constraining the neural network. And it's easier, because then its weighted sum could be whatever it wants, and it's getting something valid. So keep in mind, you could also design your own activation function if you want. Can an activation function be linear? Yes, what's the downside of having linear activation functions? Yeah, you're producing linear combinations. So as your final layer, fine. You have a linear combination of your previous layers. Okay? But if you're going to use it everywhere, not good. All right, convolutional neural networks. What is a convolution? Let's look at a All right, so here we've got a nice site that just shows a grayscale image, right? And we can see, it's hard to see, but the, these are just numbers here. I think they're between 0 and 255, right? And it's just showing the particular associated pixel value. Does that make sense? All right. Convolution, we're going to look at a 3 by 3 convolution or 3 by 3 kernel. And this one claims to sharpen, we'll look at what happens. So let's look at what happens. We go in the top left. Uh, we take our three by three matrix, or our convolution, and we basically put it on the, at the top left. Okay? And so what's gonna happen? That's gonna be 206, because that is the very top left value. We're gonna multiply that by zero, because again, it's zero, negative one, zero, negative one, five, negative one, zero, negative one, zero, is our convolution, is our kernel. So we're going to pointwise multiplication nine times and then sum it together. And that's our convolution value. And then what do we do? Then we take the convolution and we move it over one. And then we get a new value. What about here? So I have a three by three convolution, but I'm only, I've only got two by three of it or three by two of it on the image. This one seems to say we end up with, well, we have question mark, right? And so it puts kind of question mark around the, around the outside of it. Um, yeah. This is what's called, this is this here, it's a three by three matrix. So it is the convolution, also called the kernel. And various values of these do various things. 
like you could sharpen, you could do an outline like this. Okay, so there are lots of different things. We are not going to be designing any convolutions, right? We don't design convolutions. We design programs that design convolutions, right? So our neural network is going to be learning these convolutions. So if it wants something to be sharp for some reason, it'll figure out a sharp, sharp convolution. So um, we just go through every almost every pixel, right? Because of the fact that we've got a three by three, we're ignoring the outer edge. So our resulting image actually is slightly smaller than we started with. So if we have a 200 by 200 image and we do a three by three convolution, we're gonna end up with something of size 198 by 198. Yeah. So, what if there's a lot of negative values, but since we started with like here, it should be five, how is it going to like capture the negative values on the graph? Oh, um, yeah, let, let, me, let me look at that. So, let's see, let's go back. We got our sharpen, which has negatives, and We'll go, let's say, we want a black one. There we go. There's a negative. It looks like it, here it's pinning it to zero. Okay. So basically, yeah, it's, it's doing a ReLU afterwards, pinning it to zero. Um, and I guess in general, if you have an arbitrary convolution, uh, then however you're... Let me back up a second. So the output of convolutions sometimes can be images. Later on, we're going to be looking and we're not... You could display something as an image, but they're not necessarily images. They're just calculations that are happening because we're going to now take convolutions of convolutions. The workflow of this is take our convolution, right. um, and so if we have 100 by 100, then we have a 10 to the fourth inputs, right? We're going to come out with 98 by 98 outputs, and each of them will be calculated by doing this 3 by 3, multiply by 9 of the surrounding values, add a bias, do a ReLU. Alright, let me give another next place. So here's what we're going to do here. So this is going to show, this is an interesting visualization done by a guy who works on Google Translate. And so I don't know if you've seen the goggles, I'm not sure what it's called now, but it's basically a live translation, right? So you can show in Google Translate, like look at a menu, you know, and it will um, on top of it live show the, show the translation. So here's what we're doing. We have the letter A, and we're trying to recognize the letter A. So we've got A. And now what we go through and do is run this convolution over it. So we're running this 3x3 three three convolution over this, creating this new array of values, which we know is one dimension shorter in each direction. And we're using a specific, let's see if I can figure out. I can't quite see what the convolution is, okay? but it's a particular convolution. It might be a convolution that finds top edges. We're not talking about how we create the convolution, how we learn the convolution. We're just looking at what you do with the convolution. So it's all forward pass right now we're looking at. Right. 
So take these nine pixels, multiply each one by the associated one in the kernel, and we move through, and we get something that looks like it's maybe a left edge detector or something. So a, uh, a vertical edge detector, maybe. Now we're done. Almost we're done. Actually, there's something important to look at here, which we're going to get back in just a second. So here, the source image and the target image are actually the same size. And the reason for that is, look, they're actually going off the edge. Craziness, huh? We're going to talk about that when we talk about padding. Because it's a pain if every time you do convolutions, the thing gets a little smaller and a little smaller and a little smaller. Okay, so we're done with that. Our convolution is done. Now we say, okay, next convolution. Because we're not working with just one convolution. We're working with multiple convolutions at every stage. Okay, so this is still, let's say, in the first layer. How we've been working, right, we had a number of weights at each layer. And each neuron had a weight matrix. Here we're going to say we have a bunch of neurons. Each of them has its own convolution matrix. Okay, so we may have 10 convolutions that we're going to apply at this layer. So each of them has its own 3x3 three three matrix. And each of them is going to produce output. Does that concept make sense? Okay, so we go through, and this convolution is operating differently. It seems to be doing like horizontal lines instead. And then, here's the key. We take those convolutions, the output of the convolutions, and back up a second. First, what do we do? We add a bias, which we'll just ignore, but there's, there's a bias there. Let's assume it's zero right now. And reds are negative, greens are positive. What happens from here to here? Separating the positives, and the name of that is ReLU, right? So we're doing a ReLU on each of these. Add the bias and do the ReLU. And then we're going to take these convolutions. Sorry, we're going to take the outputs, right? Those uh, activations, right? Because these are activations because they've come through the ReLU sigmoid. And we're going to put them together. We're going to put them together by like just putting them next to each other. So we have sort of a, a, a uh, I was just thinking, oh. Sometimes what happens is we want to make it smaller. So what this does is a max pooling. So this says take every four elements and turn it into one. So just take the max of every four. That will cut this down by a factor of two. So it makes it smaller, so we have less to work with. So that's one operation one can do. And you can see it's, it still tends to kind of represent what, what, what was there in the original. Now we go through, and we put those two together. right? So we're going to have a convolution that's operating not on nine values, but on how many values? 18, it's a three by three by two, okay? Because we're operating on both of the pulled outputs of these. So if you want a convolution that just cares about the first one of these, you could have the other nine values all be zero. Right? Or vice versa, or you can have a mix of the two. So it's seeing the output from the previous layer and convolving over all that data. But spatially, this represents the same information from our original image, right? The top left pixel here represents how many pixels in the original image? More than four. How do you get four? Did you say max pooling? Yeah. So max pooling, this one definitely refers to four here. Okay. 
And now, if we go back to the original, well, it depends whether we have that padding or not. Um, let's ignore the top left one, and let's look at an arbitrary one in the middle. Okay, so we go from here to here takes us to four pixels. How many pixels did we look at in the original image to compute those four pixels? So, right, we had three by three. It was one on either side, basically. So we had six by six, or a total of 36 pixels. Taking us to one. Its field of view, it could see as far as uh, three in either direction, taking into account the max pooling and the convolution. Here, we're seeing one in either direction, right? Any particular value in here, we look one in each direction. Does the concept make sense? The particulars don't have to matter that much, as long as the idea kind of makes sense, yeah. All, there is overlap between those four, so let me... Uh, <laughs> so we have four that went down one, right? and here, let's look at this one here, that came from, and this is, I'm assuming you missed up on the side there, so I don't have to worry about the, the padding. So we had nine by nine. That all went down to this one, right? To here, oh, you're right. It's not six, is it? Because this one. Just like on my computer. Let me do different colors. Right? Goes to here. Yes? And so therefore, we're not looking at 6 by 6. We're looking at 4 by 4. Except for that. Okay. All right, so we go through, we run a convolution, which in this case is a three by three by two convolution, and then we do another convolution with a totally different kernel, a totally different set of parameters, three by three by two. Okay. Go ahead, Drew. What are the trying to compute? Like, I, I see like this is a pixel but in this example, what, what are you like, trying to do? As you're getting past the first layer, right. it is really hard to say. <laughs> okay, it is coming up with key information from what's been drawn, right? It's been coming up with some complicated features, and as you get deeper and deeper into the network, the features are more and more complicated. So you can imagine the idea that maybe the first layer does horizontal and vertical lines and diagonal lines, and the second layer puts those together and maybe can get the idea of a square, let's say a small square. Okay? And then third layer is both seeing more area and has had more information that, that has come in. You might get things like circles. And later on you might get like, well, two circles and kind of a triangly thing makes sort of a face, right? And that's the idea. I remember the very first lecture we had this picture showing kind of the, the things that a convolutional network understood and, and how that changed in the different layers. It's just more and more complicated things. And then thank God we don't have to actually come up with this on our own. Right? Visions, vision type work used to be coming up with a lot of, you know, finding the edges of things, segmenting things, doing all this work. And now uh, life is simpler. Okay, so now what we do is, what did we do from here to here? From here to here was convolution. 
from here to here, we lost our red, so that means it's red. That's right. And now, we would stack these together and do another set. Could we have had more than two here? Yeah, we could have had as many as we wanted, convolutions in any layer. One of the choices of the layer is how many convolutions. A second choice is how big is the convolution. Is it 3 by 3? Is it 4 by 4? Is it 7 by 7? Where do we want to put these pooling? And now what we do, whoops, what just happened? We went ahead and came up with... So we're going to go ahead. We have these two outputs. And I have to remind myself from the picture how these outputs are actually... Yeah, we just put those two outputs together and then use them kind of as a template to say what looks best. Okay, this is... Think of it as a um, fully connected layer at the very end that is going to one of five different. And in this case, what kind of activations would they be? Soft nodes, right? Because it's not an A and a B; it's one of A, B, C, D. Okay. And so the conceptual idea is we're coming up kind of with a pattern or a fingerprint. And that fingerprint is going to be different for these various classes. All right, so let's look at the design of a. Let's look more at the building blocks of these convolutional neural, net, neural networks, and then look at some specific examples. So the convolution is a matrix, and we use to compute a pattern as we slide across the incoming image. An image, right, is sort of in quotes the incoming tensor. It's really what it is, right? It's a multidimensional array. How is it multidimensional? I mean, I see 2D. How do we get more than 2D? What's that? Colors. Colors is a good example. So our input could be multidimensions. And another example is the number of dimensions in the next layer is the number of convolutions in the previous layer. We'll see more about that. Historically, we did these by hand. We don't do that anymore. Well, we don't do that anymore in deep learning. Some of the vision people might still, but pretty much it's been taken over by deep learning. So here we got an example. right? We've got n, which is our initial input size. f is the size of our convolution. And we end up with n minus f plus 1 size. So. The top value here is going to be 1 times negative 1 plus, so let's, this 9 by 9 here. And so reading from left to right, top to bottom, negative 1, negative 1, negative 3. plus 1 plus 6 plus 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 2, right? And that equals 6, 8, 13, 19, 20, 17, 3, 2. This was not easy going from right to left. So negative 15, negative 18, 17, 11. Negative 6, negative 3, yeah, 2. And then we do the same thing for the rest. So fill all these in. So was 6 by 6. We had a 3 by 3 convolution, which means we there's one on the left side, one on the right side, and one on the top, and one on the bottom that we're ignoring. And so we go down to a, a 14 or Yeah, that it seems like a lot better. Negative 1, <laughs> negative 2, negative 5. Skip that 5. 7, 10, 13, 15. Seems a lot better. Okay. Questions on how we apply this convolution? So, 
our input to this layer is n by n. Our output, actually, let's just make it particular, 6 by 6. Our output is 4 by 4. If we had 15 convolutions, our output would be 4 by 4 by 15. The stride is, just give an example. So let's say we go here for our first one. So that's, and then for our next one, instead of moving over by one, which would be a stride of one, we move over by two, which is a stride of two. So we do that, and then our third one would be here, right? So let's just look at the value here. This would be three by, how about I just write them like this to mean plus? Negative two, one, zero, 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 negative one, negative two, negative five. So negative eight, negative seven, negative nine, negative six. Yeah, well. So there's the same idea. Let me show you. Let's do a dark blue. So we would have here, we go down by two. So the stride, we use the same stride. We use the stride in each direction. So the size of our resulting output is n minus f divided by s, so divided by the stride. So in our case, this is right 6 minus 3 divided by a stride of 2. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 minus 3 divided by 2 plus 1. Why do we have the floor here? Okay, Let me make this so we can actually read it. Seven minus three divided by two plus one equals three. So why is the floor necessary? Yeah, if we had six, then we then we'd, we'd run into trouble. Questions on the stride. Okay, padding. So when you're specifying convolution, you're specifying how big it is. And I'm just trying to think, is it all it's always square? Okay. So uh, and it's normally odd, which makes sense. And you also need to specify the stride, and then you need to specify the padding. So without padding, it gets smaller. Because not allowed. Right? With padding, we conceptually add around the outside border a padding, and commonly it's zeros. So we fill it with zeros. And then we can go ahead and be centered at the top left pixel. If we have, so if we want our input size and our output size to be the same, and we have a 3x3 three three convolution, we need a padding of 1. What if we had a 5x5 five five convolution? We need a padding of two, because basically we're looking at from the center, how many are there on the edge? And with five, there are two. So let's, this is n, and this is f, and this is p, so this equals one. Then the number here is n p 
plus 2p, because we got two extra rows, two extra columns, minus f plus 1. Right? So this is, in this case, is it 6? 6 plus 2 minus 3 plus 1 equals 8, 9, 6. And if you need to put the stride in here, the more general form is n plus 2p minus f over s floor plus 1. Or put the plus 1 in the floor if you want. But you can always just figure it out by doing a very small example. Okay. Like the simpler example would be like a 3 by 3 kernel and a 4 by 4 input. Questions on this? So we're getting just about all the building blocks. Max pooling we, we do need to talk about. Uh, we talked about it generally, so for max pooling, we take 1, 2, 3, 4, and the value here would become 4. Uh, there is a thing called average pooling. Guess what it does? It takes the average. Yeah, it's, it's a very uh, fancy concept. Here. Our value be 5. Here, our value be 8. And we just keep go through. Yes. We don't train our pooling. So like we, we, train, we train our composition, right? Yep. So we train our, our weights and our null heads. Like this is just uh, a major It just happens to like reduce the one null that's supposed to pool. Is there a reason we don't like train the weights on the elements of the pool? Yeah, I suppose. What, well, hold on a second. So you could do that with a convolution, couldn't you? So what if you used a 2 by 2 convolution with a stride of 2? Wouldn't that basically be the same thing? So, so you can do it. There, there's the building block. OK, stride of 1 says uh, overlap our pools, basically. So here we have a 4 and here. We'd have a five, and let's say here we'd have an eight. Does it make sense? Yeah. Commonly, what happens is you want to cut it down by a factor of two, and so therefore, commonly, it's two by two pulling with a stride of two. If you don't say what the stride is, the stride for pulling is assumed to be 2. If you don't say what the stride is for convolutions, the stride is assumed to be 1. All right, and as someone pointed out, RGB images. Who, who said that? Did you say that? Someone did. Um, so you might have, be convolving on RGB images. So in that case, a single 3x3 three three is not enough because you want to be operating all three layers, and you don't necessarily want to be doing the same thing for red and green and blue, right? If you're trying to find grass, right? That's your classification job. You probably want to be treating the green layer differently from the red layer and the blue layer, but not independently, right? Because if you're trying to find lines or edges, you definitely want that information at that particular location in all three of those channels, the red, green, and the blue. So we're going to take <coughs> the nine pixels from the red and compute the convolution here. Nine pixels with the green, nine pixels with the blue, sum them all together, and you get the single result. Okay. And we may do many of these convolutions. 10, 20, 100, which will be even fodder for the next layer. So here we have our multiple convolutions, ending up with multiple outputs. Now, let's not forget here, what are we doing after we do the convolution? We can do a ReLU of the output plus b. 
right? So we want to have some bias. Yeah. Do we ever also like for images, for example, like cat Oh, our inputs? No, our, 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 our outputs. Oh, our outputs? Oh, yeah, you could, you might cap them between, commonly you're going to use zero to one. We use floating points and we'll just do zero to one. And that's, yes. So we've got multiple of these, and then what we go to do, we go and stack them together for the next, right? So this will now be the input to the next slide, right? The next layer. Let's look at this. Uh, yeah. Well, if we think of a fully connected layer, so let's look at that difference. Let's say we had a fully connected layer from. Let's go to the simpler example, where we're, um, say this is our input, and this is our output. How many weights do we need? Thirty-six times. Nine. Yeah. So we would need three by three by 6 by 6, I should have written those in the other order, sorry, weights, which is a lot of weights, right? This is on the order of 36 of 300, something like that. Whereas, if we're using a 3 by 3 convolution, we only have 9 weights. So we have a couple orders of magnitude difference in terms of weights. And why is it good not to have too many weights? Oh yeah, you need more images to train because otherwise you have overfitting, right? So it's very easy to overfit if you need to. Plus, if I'm trying to find an I and I get myself a convolution, maybe in, in layer 5, that is finding eyes. I want to find eyes wherever they are in my image. Right? I don't want to have to learn uh, a eye weights here, and then separately be learning eye weights here, and separately learning eye weights here. So I can reuse that information. Does that, does that help? Okay. All right. OK. So. Here, what's our input? What size is our input? Yeah, well. it, This is two dimensional. Um, because if we look at this and this and this, well, sorry, if we look at the, let's see, 27 multiplications that'll happen. So this is the result of the sum of 27 multiplications. And each of the others is a sum of 27 multiplications. Is that? How big is this? What's the size of this input? Six by six by three. How big is this? Three by three by three. And let's say there are k of these. Okay, how big is this one? Four by four. How big is the sum of them all? Actually, yeah, here, which is right there, which is, it's four by four by k. So that'll now be the input to the next layer instead of a six by six by. Why did I say six here? Right, this is six by six by three. It'll now be a four by four by k. So the number of Convolutions of the previous um, layer tells you the number of dimensions of the last dimension here. All right, we will do notation and then we'll go into uh, some actual implementations. Did everyone get assignment two? These are individual. I guess I would, didn't make that clear. So this is this is a. Uh, all your own.